inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, two proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Gallagher proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown as item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Okay. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. And I, I know uh, you'll be one person who uh, will have been amazed by and dumbfounded, I think, by the uh, proposal, by the, or the government's proposal or proposed package for the tourism industry last, last week. Um, <clears throat> anybody who's been up to far north Queensland will understand how much devastation has been caused to the tourism industry as a result of the closure of our <clears throat> federal borders. Now, I'm not talking about our state borders here. I'm talking about our federal borders. Um, <clears throat> the decision of the, government, the federal government to close those borders has, of course, meant that all of those international tourists who used to come into this country uh, to <clears throat> see some of the greatest natural wonders uh, in the world, like the Daintree, like the uh, Great uh, Barrier Reef and all of those other magnificent places in, uh, in our north, they were looking to the federal government to come up with a package post uh, JobKeeper. Now, the first observation I'd make about that is JobKeeper <coughs> ends in two weeks' time, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. It ends in two weeks' time. Whatever the government was going to propose to replace it, now the logical thing, of course, would have been to do what the Labor Party uh, suggested we should do, which is keep JobKeeper going in those industries that have been adversely affected uh, by, <laughs> amongst other things, uh, the downturn in uh, tourism. The government decided not to do that, but they were coming up with their own package. And as we know, we saw Minister Tian go up to, uh, to Cairns. We saw, <coughs> um, saw the Treasurer go up to, uh, to Cairns. And the best that the government could come up with uh, is this uh, package, so the so-called road to recovery, or ticket to recovery, I think the Prime Minister called it. Well, <coughs> anybody who talks to Anybody in the tourism industry, whether you're a hotel operator, whether you're a, a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, restaurant or a hotel, or even an ordinary retail shop, knows that this package is not going to do the trick. It doesn't fit the bill uh, for what the uh, um, industry desperately needs at the moment. The industry was looking for some leadership from Mr Morrison and from the Treasurer. They didn't get it from this package. Now, can I give you an idea, um, <coughs> Deputy, uh, uh, Deputy President, uh, Acting Deputy President, of how silly uh, some of these proposals were? One of the proposals was to try and help Kangaroo Island. Now, <coughs> that's in our home state, and of course, Kangaroo Island does need some help. They had the bushfires, uh, terrible bushfires and terrible loss of life uh, last, uh, last year. <coughs> you might even recall the Prime Minister was unaware that there had been loss of life in, uh, in uh, Kangaroo Island. Uh, then, of course, they got hit by the pandemic. So they certainly need uh, some assistance. Um, so the government decided that they would give cheap tickets from, to Kangaroo Island. Now, of course, there are no international flights into Kangaroo Island. I don't know why. Um, as the former tourism minister, we approved an extension to the length of the uh, uh, the uh, airport in uh, Kingscote, which would have allowed for uh, that, but for one reason or another, there are no international flights. So the only way, the only way you can get by by, by plane uh, to um, uh, Kangaroo Island is to fly to Adelaide. Now, under the original proposal, which we've now seen, yeah, um, I can see I can see uh, Senator Hanson Young is also shocked. But the only way you can get from into Kangaroo Island, you can't get through from an international flight, uh, you've got to go via Adelaide. So the original proposal, which we have now seen, is on the, uh, on the original website, included the concept of flying into Adelaide and then flying on to Kangaroo Island. But the incompetence of this government, the incompetence of this government, when they finally announced their package, they left 
Adelaide off the list. So, yeah, no, no, you're right. You're right. We don't, we don't agree on much, uh, Senator Hanson Young, but we do agree on this because it was outrageous. Because you couldn't fly into Kangaroo Island unless you flew into Adelaide. Now, <clears throat> I understand the Premier found out that originally Adelaide had been included. When he saw the list, of course, it hadn't been included, it had been excluded. Uh, and of course, he jumped up and down, and Adelaide got added to the list. Now, that, that's just one small portion of the outrageous way in which this government has treated the tourism Thank industry. You, Senator Farrell. Senator MacDonald. Thank you. So, uh, to question the coalition's commitment to our tourism sector displays a cynicism that is unworthy of even the most partisan political hack. And I'm sorry to interrupt the love-in between the, uh, the opposition and the Greens that uh, I've just been watching, but I'm reminded of a quote attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. There are th three classes of people, those who see, those who see when they are shown, and those who, who do not see. And because the Labor Party falls into the category of those who do not see, I'll indulge them with some truths. The Coalition's tourism assistance package alone is worth $1.2 billion spread across subsidised flights for tourists, expanding our offer of guaranteed loans for businesses on top of the already $3 billion in loans that have been processed. We've allocated cash payments to travel agents, cash for zoos to keep feeding animals and subsidies for regional airport security costs. But what I've outlined only just scratches the surface of the coalition's commitment to one of our biggest industries. We've also brought in tax breaks for businesses that have been most welcomed and spent millions on domestic tourism advertising uh, campaigns urging Aussies to holiday at home. The extraordinary thing, though, is that having sat on the COVID-impacted aviation inquiry, I watched the TWU in unison with airlines call for exactly this sort of package—$1.2 billion spent on 800,000 uh, seats to allow Australians to fly into communities that have been the most heavily impacted by international tourism cuts. And it is extraordinary to me that, having sat in those hearings, having heard uh, union after union explain that what they wanted is their employees connected to their real jobs. They wanted training uh, and currency so that they remained uh, able to operate a safe airline industry. And when we have delivered on that, when the government has delivered on 800,000 flights to actually have people with their bottoms in seats flying around the country, allowing baggage handlers to work, allowing caterers to work, allowing pilots uh, and air crew to work, not just be tied to businesses through JobKeeper, but actually have their jobs operating to restore confidence in the tourism industry, because thanks to the Labor governments in Queensland and Victoria and others shutting the borders at a moment's notice, there is now no confidence, no confidence in Australians to book flights because they're worried they'll be trapped. They'll be trapped somewhere a long way from home and have to do two weeks of quarantine. And so, having delivered on exactly what it is that industry and the unions, in partnership, spent days talking about in this inquiry, now when it's actually delivered, no, no, uh, they've got to take another opportunity to be critical of the government as we recover from the worst pandemic in human memory. Uh, the other th point that I'd add is that having real people flying on real planes to real destinations, Every dollar spent in flights equates to approximately $10 on the ground. That is um, accommodation, that uh, experiences, going out to the reef, going out to see things at Kangaroo Island where I've never been but I look forward to going one day, uh, to buying an ice cream or a meal in a restaurant. These are all important multipliers that mean that people are back engaged in the sort of world that we want to be. Uh, so I am are comparing uh, our approach to the Queensland Labor government, which has been engaged in some of the most shameful political grandstanding I've seen. It has used people's genuine health concerns to drive a stake 
into the heart of Queensland's tourism, once again strong, at once strongly beating heart by unilaterally closing borders without notice and, as I said, smashing consumer confidence. And then not only that, it has tried to blame the federal coalition when we have given more than $28 billion in support to Queensland alone, while state labour has barely been able to manage to afford to rustle up $8 billion, primarily because it is broke. Finan federal labour would do well to advise its Queensland arm to get its finances in order and start delivering for tourism in Queensland. Senator Hanson Young. to this uh, debate uh, this afternoon and just what an absolute shambles this government's tourism announcement has been an absolute shambles first of all within 6 hours of the announcement new destinations had to be added of course uh, adelaide was added and darwin we've heard from those who work within the broader tourism industry just how disappointed they are that despite all the calls for action and support for months and months now what they've been left with is very little so it might help the big corporate airlines but of course the small tourism operators right across the country are left with virtually nothing and of course at the end of this month come march those who have been relying on jobkeeper are not going to be able to rely on that either. So not only is tourism slumped in these places, but what has been keeping many people's head above water is about to end as well. The government's taken its sweet time getting to a point of announcing any type of tourism package. And then when it was put on the table, it's missed the mark, it's delivered for the big end of town and is doing nothing for those in those small businesses, in rural and regional and metro areas that rely week to week, month to month, season to season uh, on the tourism uh, dollars and business. And of course, the other key element of the tourism industry that still uh, is being left out in the cold is the arts and the entertainment industry. Still nothing of any value has been put on the table by this government to support artists across the country and entertainers, despite the fact that it was the arts and the entertainment industry that was the first hit by COVID when those restrictions first came in, when the lockdowns came in 12 months ago, venues closed, events cancelled, people out of work. And they are still, Mr Acting Deputy President, out of work. And despite, despite the constant calls for more support from the government, for inclusion uh, in JobKeeper, for a, a arts and entertainment specific package, we still see nothing uh, of much value from this government. Now, uh, Senator Farrell has already spoken about what a shambles even uh, the announcement in relation to being able to fly to Kangaroo Island was. And I must say, for everybody in South Australia, we saw straight away what an absolute joke uh, this announcement was. No wonder it had to be fixed within uh, or less than uh, six hours of the announcement being made. But overall, Mr Acting Deputy President, I ask this. At the end of March, when JobKeeper finishes, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be having a, uh, their wages cut or their jobs lost. What good is a holiday if you don't have a job? What good is a holiday if you don't have a job, Mr Acting Deputy President? And this government continues to miss the mark over and over again. And why did we see this announcement rushed out so quickly late last week? Well, it was because, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Prime Minister knew that news poll was out in the field this weekend. That's what this was about. This was about trying to buy some votes, buy some positive publicity, and they still stuffed that up, Mr Acting Deputy President. You splash around $1.2 billion and you can't even get it right. $1.2 billion in order to buy a bit of a bump in the polls when everything's going pretty shabby on your side of government, and, the, and this Prime Minister still can't get it right. 
Well, Australians aren't silly, and they're not going to be bought uh, and treated like mugs so easily. We know that people are, there are many people who are still doing it really tough. They've had their wages cut. They've lost their jobs. They're desperately waiting for the season to come back around so that they can invest in their tourism business or they can keep working in their casual job. And rather than doing what the industry called for, which was an extension of JobKeeper, an extension of support across the board for the tourism industry, for the arts and the entertainment industry, the government decided to look after the big corporates in the airlines and have a she'll be right attitude for those small business operators and casual workers who actually do all the hard yakka. And it is just unthinkable that the Prime Minister thought that this was going to be enough to satisfy workers, to satisfy the Australian people, and to make people think that they were serious about supporting the tourism industry. So the Prime Minister has got to go back to the drawing board. We need a decent tourism package, support for small, medium businesses, sole traders, those who rely and have been smashed because of COVID-19 economically, and for those workers in the industries that rely on tourism, like arts and entertainment, hospitality, those workers need to know that this government is willing to look after them too. And all they're being told so far is no, they're not. So the Prime Minister has got to go back to the drawing board and come up with something better, because this ain't it. This ain't it. And I ask again, what good is a half-price holiday if you don't even have a job? And that's the problem the Prime Minister is not willing to fix. Uh, sorry, Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, quite frankly, when the government is in trouble, what does the Prime Minister do? He throws around money. And as the previous speaker said, $1.2 billion has been splashed around, but he can't even get that right. If you really were interested in, in saving jobs, and if we look at the, the destinations in Tasmania that have been picked for this investment, it was uh, Burnie, Devonport and Launceston just happens to be the two held marginal seats of Liberal members. And then the afterthought to include Hobart. But Tasmania's mighty tourism sector is at risk, and it's at risk because this government has no plan and it has refused to actually listen to the sector. By abolishing JobKeeper at the end of the month, it will have an impact on over a million workers, not only affecting my home state but right across this country. And thousands of working families in Tasmania are going to be without jobs or either not enough hours. And this investment in the airline industry by giving people a half fares is okay if you've got a job, but if you haven't got a job, that's of no benefit to you at all. But the Morrison government made an announcement back in September last year, on the 27th of September last year, a $50 million recovery regional tourism fund to support nine tourism regions who have been hit hard by the travel restrictions imposed by COVID-19, and Tasmania was allocated $13.5 million of this fund. Almost six months later, how much money has gone to Tasmanian tourism industry? Not a cent. Not a cent. In fact, the applications for this grant don't even close until the 30th of September 2021. So once again, Prime Minister Morrison is there for the photo opportunities and the big announcement, but there's no follow-up. So struggling tourism sector in Tasmania are going to have to wait until at least 2022 before they see any of that $13.5 million to come to Tasmania. In the meantime, we know that travel agents are finding it extremely difficult, and this injection of funds won't help 
one travel agent because they don't actually make money out of internal travel in the country. Their money is made through bookings for uh, international travel and um, cruises. So this is not going to help them whatsoever. Now, the government is employing what they do best, and that is policy on the run. And with these cheap flights, it is so clear to see their transparency of pork barrelling marginal seats with their latest scheme is a new low. It was only after lobbying and outrage from the sector that Hobart, the capital, the regional uh, state in Australia of Tasmania, was added to the destination. Hobart was sort of there and then it was taken away and then it was put back. We've had sports rorts, we've had community grants rorts, and now we have the flight rorts with this government who just keep digging themselves into a deeper and deeper hole because the Australian people aren't silly. They see through this Prime Minister, a Prime Minister who has been left wanting over and over again. and. He thinks that by throwing $1.2 billion that that is going to get him a bump in the polls. People will not forget that he has been left wanting in some of the most serious questions that this government has Thank had you, to Senator answer. And quite Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, uh, Deputy President. Uh, it's quite, quite astounding the audacity of the Labor Party when it comes to criticising the federal government on support for the tourism industry and support for the Australian economy as a whole. Now, this uh, package announced last week by the Morrison government of $1.2 billion is just a drop in the ocean compared to what we have spent overall. Now, it's interesting, this time last week I was up in Cairns. I spent a week up in North Queensland last week and the Palaszczuk government came out and announced $200 vouchers just for the city of Cairns. Right? Now, Cairns happens to be all Labor-held state seats. Did we come out and accuse the Labor government, the state Labor government, of pork barrelling or anything like that? No, absolutely not. All we happened to point out was that while, while the state Labor government was sticking a whopping $3 million into the economy of Cairns, we had previously, in the last 12 months, invested or injected over $800 million Eight hundred million dollars into the city of Cairns. Quiet. I mean, that's over 25 times more than what uh, the state Labor government is going to be doing over the next few months. So, for the Labor Party to be sitting here and saying that the federal government is actually putting the tourist sector at risk is not true at all. And it's worth noting, it's worth noting that if any industry has been impacted. Uh, by the inconsistencies uh, displayed by the state governments, especially the state Labor governments, because in the main it's been the state Labor governments, the three big ones, Victoria, Queensland and WA, who've kept their borders closed, who kept their borders closed and who kept flip-flopping as to when borders were open and as to when borders were closed. And it was interesting, just at the start of this year, uh, I got an enormous amount of feedback. I got trolled big time by, of course, the Labor trolls and the digital lynch mob on uh, social media. But you know, late last year, we had the chief medical officer of Queensland come out and say, we don't need to lock down again. We've got this under control. We go for 130 days with no cases, and then we have one case, just one case in quarantine. That, you know, so the source of it was known. And what did uh, the state premier do? The Queensland state premier do at nine o'clock on Friday morning. She came out and said she's going to lock down the city of Brisbane to over two million people at five o'clock that afternoon. Now, thousands of uh, workers in the hospitality industry were directly impacted by that. Now, what's we, what we've got to remember here is this was the first week back this year. A lot of businesses were restarting. They were going to make a fresh start, a new year. Uh, they get to Friday, the first weekend of the year, and what happens? The state Labor government shuts down Brisbane, uh, resulting in the loss of thousands and thousands, if not, I, I suspect, millions of dollars uh, in losses for the hospitality industry. Now, we heard uh, when we were talking about the uh, uh, aviation sector, we had the CEO of Virgin come out and call for the state governments to have a consistent framework in regards to number one, border closures, 
and number two, the restrictions on hospitality venues across the country. Now, I've also got a very good friend of mine uh, who's a leading Australian musician who has personally called me and asked for some consistency uh, in the restrictions um, across the states. He had a gig to play in Adelaide. I got a call from on the weekend. This is going back a few weeks ago. He was had a gig to play in Adelaide. He got a, um, you know, Victoria shut the border with uh, South Australia shut the vo a border with Victoria again, and suddenly he was short a bass player. And you know, it's it was all booked. The event was all booked, and then uh, you know he had to ring around and try and find someone uh, to come and play at that event. And this is the sort of uh, inconsistency that is leading to a lack of confidence, a lack of confidence in the hospitality sector. Uh, and the tourism sector in opening up. Now, it's worth noting that as we head into winter this year, this is a fantastic opportunity for southern, um, southerners, uh, from, especially from New South Wales and Victoria, to fly north to Queensland. Now, they would have loved to have done that last year, and at one point uh, the Premier opened up and then closed down again. Um, but this is a perfect opportunity to keep the borders open this year. Now, what we've got to remember with the tourism sector is for about the last 15 years, more people have left Australia than entered into Australia. We've actually had a deficit in the tourist numbers. So what we have is a net tourist deficit, so I more departures than arrivals. So there is an opportunity now with the international borders closed to promote internal uh, tourism across the country. And there is an opportunity uh, for the higher spenders who normally would go overseas, for them to come up to Queensland or vice versa. It is very important that the state premiers apply consistency. Now, we've now got, we've now got uh, you know, the vaccine rolling out, which should hopefully, you know, as the year rolls on, we'll get that out. Um, so we, we should have uh, contact tracing and testing in place. We've got our numbers across the country down to single digits outside of quarantine. So there is absolutely no reason while the state premiers can't give some uh, confidence to our hospitality industry and to our tourism sector. Um, and it was interesting, I note uh, Senator Polly before said uh, that you know, you've got to have a job to be able to spend money to go on a holiday. And it's interesting because I thought to myself, you've actually got to have a job to get superannuation as well. So you know, one thing I'm not going to take from the Labor Party is the, is the lack of universal, uh, universality uh, in uh, this particular package, given that they promote superannuation despite the fact that you know, unemployed people, uh, stay-at-home mums, people on disability pension uh, don't get superannuation either. And the other thing, of course, is, is the idea that tourist uh, 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 operators won't necessarily will miss out on this is not true. People aren't going to travel, uh, go travelling uh, and do nothing when they get there. They're going to, you know, for example, arrive in Cairns, they'll go in, they'll book a scuba diving trip. They might uh, book a uh, trip up to Port Douglas. They might go out in a boat. They might take some tours inland uh, to see Daintree Forest. All of those things, they can walk in off the street uh, if they want to book, book something. So there is still op opportunity uh, for um, agents, uh, travel agents, to get some, uh, uh, some spin-off eff spin effects of this. And likewise, they're not going to sit in their hotel room and eat. Uh, room service every night. They're going to go out and they're going to eat at these venues. So the idea that this money has been misallocated or miswasted uh, is just more fear-mongering and negativity from the, the, those opposite, opposite us. Uh, and quite frankly, I think the, the whole uh, uh, premise in which this MPI is based is completely, completely false. And you know, I touched on the numbers before in Cairns, and I'll just touch on them again. The state Labor government is putting $3 million into Cairns for tourism. Uh, in the last year alone, the federal government has put over $800 million in. But if we just look at the Queensland overall, the federal government has put $28.5 billion, $28.5 billion into Queensland. Now, what has the state Labor government done? They're putting in a measly $8.8 billion over the forward estimates. Over the forward estimates. And can I say, if the, state, if the Labor Party and their state uh, Labor colleagues are so worried about creating jobs, well, let me tell you the one key message I got out of North Queensland last week, and that is we need more water. We need more water. And the state Labor government has only built two dams in the last 30 years, 
One of those dams, Paradise Dam, they're now uh, pulling down or uh, not quite pulling down. They're halving the wall, the size of the wall. So they're going to reduce the size of that dam. And one other dam in Bow Desert, where the, they've actually got the water wrong, the water's break, brackish. So we are the, the people of North Queensland are calling out for more water security. You know, I saw the mayor of Port Douglas last weekend. He needs a lake. Port Douglas could actually run out of water very soon uh, if the state Labor government doesn't get busy and build a lake, a bigger lake, for Port Douglas to have some water supply. So there is a great opportunity here to take that capacity in the labour market and go and build some dams. Now I'm happy to go to the Treasurer and, and, and get an infrastructure bank up and running to fund the states to build these dams. Okay, but we've got to remember it's wealth for toil. It's wealth for toil. So here is a perfect opportunity to create more jobs, long-lasting jobs. You know, there's so many benefits off water security. We get uh, irrigation. There's benefits for agriculture. We get clean, green hydro energy. How good is that? Clean, green hydro energy. We get flood mitigation. We get flood mitigation. I mean, that will help reduce the risk and reduce insurance costs in North Queensland. We get recreational activities like water skiing. Uh, I know my hometown, you know, on the weekends in Chinchilla, we used to all go out to the weir and do water skiing and whatnot and kayak uh, back up the, uh, the mighty Condamine. So there is a great opportunity here to get busy, build dams. It's wealth for toil. It's not wealth for whinging and wailing, which is what we all, all we ever seem to get from the Labor Party. And it's about time they got with the program and started to look forward and have a vision for this country rather than looking backwards. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, over a million Australians are employed in our tourism industry, a sector which is critical for our economy as a whole uh, and is especially important for those regional communities which rely almost entirely on tourism. We know that the sector has been doing it extremely hard because of COVID, and this has real impacts for regional communities and also for the individuals, for the families, for the households who rely on the JobKeeper lifeline right now. While many sectors hit by COVID have begun to recover, tourism is different. It will continue to need help until domestic and international travel fully resumes. And JobKeeper has been absolutely vital for the sector, uh, and that is exactly why the Labor Party argued so strongly for the JobKeeper program. But we still haven't seen a plan from the government for the good, secure jobs uh, that are needed to replace JobKeeper. In Victoria alone, it is estimated that over 300,000 jobs in tourism, transport and hospitality are at risk today without JobKeeper. So it absolutely beggars belief that the government has announced a tourism package that will not protect jobs, that doesn't respond to the needs the industry itself has identified, that has been met with disappointment and confusion by tourism operators and regional communities, and that actually encourages Victorians to abandon their plans to travel to our own tourist towns and instead take a flight in interstate instead. Now, the Victorian Tourism Minister, Martin Pakula, has written to his federal counterpart asking that four extra destinations be included in the government's poorly targeted tourism package. And uh, Minister Bakula has been frank in saying that, and I quote, somewhere in the Canberra bubble there seems to be a misunderstanding about how Victorian tourism works. Uh, and he's gone on. Regional and metropolitan tourism, he says, um, is too important for it to be coloured by the electoral map. Now, Victoria has asked the Federal Tourism Minister to include Melbourne Airport, as well as the regional airports in Mildura, Bendigo and Albury in New South Wales in the scheme. Now, given the on-again, off-again naming of locations by the government in this scheme, Victorians will have to watch closely to see whether their airports and towns make it onto the list and, indeed, if they do, whether they stay on the list. Let's face it, this scheme is an absolute shambles, and it has been a shambles from day one. 
And the Deputy Prime Minister's shambolic interview over the weekend failed to reassure tourism operators or anyone else, for that matter, that the government has a plan to get local economies back on track. This scheme is a politicised vote-buying exercise. That is what it is. It is not a jobs plan. It is a politicised vote-buying scheme put forward by this government. And what Victorians want is a federal government that will actually support a plan for a real recovery uh, that will look after the people of Victoria and that will back the tourism operators and make sure local jobs are protected. Victorian regional communities are definitely doing it tough, and they need a federal government that backs them up. The people and regions that rely on tourism need a real plan from this government, uh, and they absolutely deserve better from the government. There are just too many Victorians employed in this industry to let it fail under this shambolic government scheme. Thank you, Senator. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this MPI and I want to condemn the Labor Party for its economically reckless position it has adopted in opposing the Morrison government's $1.2 billion aviation and tourism package. I'm a proud Victorian senator and I'm very disappointed by the contribution of Senator Walsh, who clearly does not understand what is going on in Victoria. Last Friday, I visited the Great Ocean Road Chocolate Tree and Ice Creamery. It's a business which is based in three different locations, the Mornington Peninsula, the Yarra Valley, and on the Great Ocean Road near Anglesey. And when Daniel Andrews imposed the snap five-day lockdown across Victoria, when there was not one regional COVID case anywhere in our state, this business lost $300,000 in five days. And there are countless businesses in Victoria. On the Valentine's Day weekend, restaurants, accommodation providers, tourist parks, and tourist destinations like the Chocolate Tree, which suffered. And I have not heard Labor members, Labor senators in this place, speak out about the enormous economic damage that Victorian businesses have suffered as a result of unnecessary restrictions in Victoria, including the last day, five day lockdown. That lockdown cost our state $1 billion. So perhaps if Senator Walsh had done her homework, she would understand that businesses like the Chocolate Tree depend on a clientele from interstate, which amounts to some 22 per cent of their overall clientele. After the most exceptionally difficult year, Ian and Leanne Neeland back this package. They believe that half price tickets to Avalon Airport commencing on the 1st of April will make a difference. And why will it make a difference? Because tourism businesses cannot function, they cannot operate without tourists. And since the confidence of so many tourists has been destroyed because so many people are reluctant to cross the border into Victoria because of the way the border lockdowns have been managed in Victoria. This is not just a huge incentive to come to Victoria from places like Queensland and also Sydney into Avalon. This is a great confidence booster. As Ian Nealon said, Anything that can be done to attract more people to the region is really welcome. Almost 22 per cent of our customers pre-COVID were from interstate, and now there are virtually none. Just imagine having more than 20 per cent of your customer base wiped out. They need confidence to travel, and perhaps this package can be helpful. 
The bottom line is that passenger arrivals to Avalon Airport fell over 72 per cent in 2020 due to COVID. Our region's tourism sector employs some 17,000 people just in the, in the Geelong and Great Ocean Road region and contributes almost a billion dollars to the local economy. Already we've seen the support package prompting a 75 per cent increase in the number of Australians searching for domestic holidays online. And I absolutely condemn the partisan attack by the member for Corio, Mr Miles, and the member for Corangamite, the current member for Corangamite, Ms Coker, who have once again failed to stand up for our region. In asserting that this package is too focused on marginal seats, Labor continues to put politics ahead of constituents in the Corio and Corangamite electorates. Avalon Airport is deep in the heart of the Corio electorate. It services the Wyndham region, Western Melbourne. It services southwest Victoria, and it services much of Victoria because it's so easy to fly in and out of. And we are so proud, the Morrison government, of the work that we have done to stand up for regional tourism through our Geelong City deal, through our investment in the international terminal at Avalon Airport, creating Victoria's second international airport. And I absolutely say to Mr Miles, with the majority of workers at Avalon Airport from the Corio and Lawler electorates and with so many businesses in our region dependent on tourists coming to our region, Labor's failure to back half price tickets to Avalon and all the other airports we have designated shows a reckless disregard for the tourism and hospitality sectors. So I call on as many Australians as possible to visit our region, to eat in our restaurants, to sample our wineries, to spend up big and, of course, to visit wonderful tourist attractions like the Great Ocean Road Chocolate Tree and Ice Creamery. It is rather interesting that uh, Mr Albanese he visited Karangamite last Friday and it was all negativity and no solutions. He was accompanied by the current member for Karangamite, someone who failed to back fast rail between Melbourne and Geelong, someone who stood shoulder to shoulder with Mr Shorten and his $387 million of taxes and is now embroiled in a grubby war with the CFMEU, which is demanding the member for Karangamite repay hundreds of thousands of dollars. She backed a state Labor Geelong City deal, which did not include one project in Karangamite. She failed to speak up about the restrictions which caused so much grief in regional communities right across Victoria, including in Karangamite. She failed to say a thing to stand up to the Victorian Labor government when they shut down the Rip Curl Classic, which has now moved to New South Wales, costing local businesses in Torquay and Janjuk and Belbray and across the surf coast countless hundreds of thousands of dollars. She even failed to stand up and speak out against the human rights abuses in Victoria when people were shut in their homes with no notice, most notably those shut in the public housing towers. And now Ms Coker is failing to stand up for tourism businesses, hotels, pubs, cafes, restaurants, which need tourists. They need a market. This is a very important package for our country. It includes a whole range of different elements. Of course, there is the 800,000 half price tickets, and uh, the government and the Prime Minister has made it very clear that if there is a case for further airports to be added, then we will do so. But how ridiculous of Minister Bakula to be advocating for Tullamarine Airport to be included in this package so that business travellers can have their tickets to Melbourne subsidised. I mean, already we are seeing hotels in Melbourne subsidised to the tune of $1 million because of the hotel quarantine program, which is actually not currently being used. 
We have seen an absolute disaster with the hotel quarantine program in Victoria, which has led to more than 800 deaths. And frankly, when you compare the fact that our government has stood shoulder to shoulder with all Victorians, delivering in excess of $40 billion of support, I condemn Labor for rejecting this package. This is not just important for hotels and pubs and cafes in our important regional tourist areas. It's important for our, the viability of our airlines. It's important for airline workers. It's important for travel agents. And it's important for businesses which now can access a new government-backed loan scheme where the government is backing these loans to the tune of up to 80 per cent. So this is an incredibly important spend for our country, $1.2 billion, including for regional Victoria, and I condemn the Labor Party for opposing this critically important rescue package. Thank you. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to um, speak on the impact of the removal of JobKeeper um, will have on the tourism sector and the wider economy, and particularly in my home state of Tasmania. But I wouldn't like to let an opportunity go by to comment uh, just quickly on Senator Henderson's uh, contribution. Uh, and you know, I really ha have to wonder whether Senator Henderson has got over the fact that uh, the people of Kering might just prefer Ms. Coker. They chose Ms. Coker to represent them, and I, I really think, um, you know, th there was an opportunity. There was a, re a reason for that, and, and it's because Ms. Coker is an extraordinary local member, hardworking, passionate, and committed to her electorate. Now, one of the things that um, has been said in this uh, contribution is um, a, around the fact about the, the um, areas that have been selected. Now, anyone, anyone, if they were really fair dinkum, would say that this government, the announcement of this initiative, was a failure. You, it's, it's amazing to me that you have Government members come up, government members and senators come up and try to spin that extra, extra um, areas, extra cities, extra towns have been added because they've made a case. Now, we know that's not correct. We know that there was a list that was put out there accidentally, presumably, and then suddenly the official list was reduced by three, which included Hobart my, in my home state of Tasmania. Now, come on. You've got to wonder. I mean, this government has mucked up so much. They, they have failed in so many ways in terms of initiatives and uh, funding and grants that don't reach where they're supposed to be reaching. They don't reach the communities they're supposed to be reaching. They don't reach the people they're supposed to be reaching. And this, this announcement is no different. They are wanting, saying to the Australian people, oh, 24 hours later, oh, we've, um, had, they've had, we've had representations and we're going to add uh, Adelaide and Darwin. Then three days later, after the original announcement, we're going to add Hobart. Nothing to do with people jumping up and down, the tourism industry jumping up and down, um, the uh, Labor politicians in Tasmania jumping up and down uh, saying, why isn't Hobart on there? You know, so here we are. Sorry? Senator, Senator Brown, just ignore I think the I've, um, that is exactly what I'm saying, that it, we had people jumping up and down and the government realising once again that they've made an error, they've uh, mucked up the whole announcement and the fact, and the fact that the original list 
the original this was tweeted out. So you've got to ask, really, was this all about marginal seats? And unfortunately, unfortunately, this is what this government's all about. It's all about politics. Politics first. And it's not about the people, it's not about the community. And it, that is why they have continued to get rid of JobKeeper when they should have been doing something. Okay. Senator McCarthy. Hear, hear, Senator Brown. Hear, hear. I would like to just uh, speak about the Northern Territory, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, tourism is the lifeblood of the Northern Territory, and in 2018-19, uh, tourism directly employed 8,400 people in the Territory, and that's 6.3 per cent of overall Northern Territory employment. It supported 15,600 jobs, or 11.8 per cent of the region's total employment. And in the same period, total tourism gross state produce (GSP) was 2.6 billion, or 9.5% of GSP. So you can see by these figures, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that tourism is a critical part of our economy in the north. And while the territory has done a remarkable job in keeping us safe from COVID, our tourism industry has been hit hard. You only have to see the stories in recent months, in particular around our icons, our jewels of the Northern Territory in terms of the national parks of Uluru and of Kakadu. Let's not forget all of the others in the tourism industry of the Northern Territory, hospitality, the hotels, accommodations, uh, the cafes, the stores, all of these, the campgrounds, the caravan parks, are so vital, especially now, uh, in particular in the top end, Mr Acting Deputy President, as we prepare for the dry season, which is, uh, in, in terms of the north, uh, a very critical point of having people come and spend their money and get away from the cold climates like Canberra and Melbourne and Sydney. But this government's refusal to listen to the needs of the tourism industry in the wake of cutting off JobKeeper kicks them when they're down. Alice Springs, Uluru and apparently Darwin, which was added at the last minute, or was there a bit of a confusion? Was it there initially and then taken off, put back on because of the cries um, that said, here in the Northern Territory, we're missing out? And it's great that Darwin is back on, don't get me wrong, but just the confusion, confusion that uh, was carried around that uh, just upset people even more, thinking, well, we, we obviously don't matter. So when these, prices, or these places were added at the last minute and are included in the half-price airfare scheme, I mean, how is it going to actually impact the tour operators, the cafes, restaurants, accommodation providers, retailers, taxi drivers, high car companies, all of this is still unknown. And it is astounding, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the government is expecting cash-strapped Australians to spend their own money trying to save our tourism industry when it won't do the same. And it might shock members of the government to learn many Australian families actually can't afford the airfares to Darwin and Alice Springs, even at half price. It would cost a family of four over $2,000 to fly from Sydney or Melbourne uh, to Alice Springs at current prices, and that doesn't count the cost of accommodation, tours and the rest. So whilst I highly recommend that people visit us in the Northern Territory, uh, the fact is many Australian families just can't afford this at the moment. And Territory businesses are worried. They're staring into an uncertain future, especially in the regional centres of the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory Government's uh, tourism voucher scheme has assisted many to stay afloat, and I certainly commend the Territory Government for that. But companies which rely heavily on international visitation, like the bus and tour operators, are looking at grim times. The owners of businesses like Emu Run, Uluru Camel Tours and Way Outback Safaris are going to be forced to make some very tough decisions Senator with cutbacks with JobKeeper McCarthy. ending on March Your 28. Time has expired. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, last week we saw the public treated to a live set of the Prime Minister's greatest hits. Selective pork barrelling, corporate welfare and policy by photo op. 
After a year of unimaginable anxiety and uncertainty for aviation and tourism industry workers, they tuned into the morning news to see the Prime Minister grinning at them from an A380, A330 Airbus, brandishing a novelty-sized boarding pass. Our ticket to recovery, he said. He called it the aviation package, except that it wasn't. The Morrison government's ticket to recovery was in fact a cynical attempt to buy votes in marginal seats and give more, millions more of public money to Qantas and Virgin, all with no requirement that Qantas keep their staff connected to their jobs. We've seen this attempt by the government where we've seen really socialism for the rich and powerful while the working people of this country get next to nothing. No guarantees, no obligations on that money that's being uh, handed out. There is no sector of the economy in which workers have suffered more during the COVID-19 pandemic than the aviation sector. And yet the Australian government has consistently sold those workers short and sold them out again with this announcement. At every possible opportunity, the Prime Minister has had to give these workers a helping hand. He has pulled that hand away. A recent report by the OECD found that the Morrison government has, has been ranked 18 out of 28 OECD countries in COVID-19 support for the aviation industry. That's 18 out of 28 in the OECD. They're behind the Netherlands, the US, UK, Switzerland, even Portugal. And as a direct result of the Morrison government abandoning the aviation sector, Australia has recorded among the highest rate of job losses in the sector at over 30 per cent, compared to just 19.5 per cent in the United States and 15 per cent in Singapore. How do you get an airline industry back up and running at short notice to make sure that we're ready after COVID? Of course, the stories have been you know, wide and largely spoken about the abandonment by this government, the heartbreaking stories of workers like catering and cleaning workers at Donata. Of course, the Morrison government excluded the JobKeeper program for those workers. And to the ground handlers with decades of dedicated service to Qantas who saw their roles outsourced in the middle of the pandemic. Now, we heard from Peter Seymour during a recent Senate inquiry. Now, Peter was a Qantas employee for 31 years towing aircraft between hangars and terminals. In 2019, Peter was diagnosed with stage five prostate cancer. He continued to work for Qantas though, until the side effects of his radiation therapy made this impossible, and he went on to sick leave. In the middle of the pandemic, Qantas took Peter off sick leave, off sick leave and said that he was forced to return to work to pay the bills until he was forced to take redundancy. He said, I was put in a position by Qantas, not COVID, Qantas. And of course, Desiree, another worker who has been outsourced by Qantas. I cannot explain to you what the stress has meant to me, and I don't think my happiness will ever be restored. Well, Peter and Desiree, like thousands of other workers, have been abandoned by this government. Pork barrelling, novelty boarding passes <coughs> and gimmicky photo ops. We need Aviation Keeper. And I urge the Morrison government to finally step up. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. The time for discussion has expired.